Welcome to the NZI podcast. Here we talk all things international, from trade to geopolitics to diplomacy. The NZIA seeks to encourage an understanding of the importance of global affairs to the political and economic well-being of New Zealand, as in this interconnected age, what happens beyond these shores affects us all at home. On this episode of the NZIA podcast, the Governor-General, the Right Honourable Dame Patsy Reddy, speaks to the NZIA about the international dimensions to her role in this audio of the event. As the outgoing Governor-General, Dame Patsy reflects on her role in promoting NZ international relations, both within NZ and overseas. The event was held on the 22nd of June at University of Victoria, Wellington. Professor Bryson, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, e tēnā koutou e ngā mihi o te pō. I'm very happy to follow you, Professor Bryson, saluting the whare in which the faculty and the institution are present because of the long-standing relationship that the Institute has uh, with the University going back many decades. That relationship is central to an organisation which seeks to enlighten and interest civil society in issues to do with international issues for our country. That approach brings to this room, or ones like it at the university generally, events often two and three times per month, engaging the attention of many hundreds of students, graduates and members of the general community. I acknowledge with thanks the presence of the Chancellor of the University, Neil Pavia Smith, the Dean of the Law School, Mark Hickford, who's just sent a message that I received as we sat down, who was on his way after another meeting. You, of course, Professor Bryson, Head of the School of Business, as well as your governance roles with the universities. On the Institute side, there are a great many representatives, erstwhile life members, such as the Right Honourable Sir Kenneth Keith, erstwhile professor in the Faculty of Law and judge of the International Court of Justice, and Lady Jocelyn Keith, Emeritus Professor and former Vice-Chancellor of Longstanding, Emeritus Professor Les Holborough, and Wellington branch of the Institute Chairperson, Karim Dickey. Welcome to you all. I come then to the business of the evening. Our distinguished guest, the Governor-General, is, as we have learned, a graduate of the Victoria University, and at an early point in her career, worked as a lecturer in the law school. A career in law practice and business then followed, along with many appointments and briefs from those quarters as well as the government. In 2016 came her appointment as Governor-General, an office which she has held for more than 1,700 days as, as, as I speak, during many unique times. I instanced locally the COVID pandemic and the Christchurch mosque shootings in 2019, and internationally, uh, the contributions she has been able to make uh, to further offshore interests of our country. In many of these ventures, she's been accompanied by her husband, Sir David Gascoigne, who's also able to be present this evening. At an early point in your term, Your Excellency, you agreed to be patron of the Institute, the fifth holder of your office to do so, and that gesture was greatly appreciated. As has also been said by Professor Bryson, Your Excellency may be assured of an interested audience for what you have to say on the topic of international dimensions of the Governor-General's role. This very room has seen a number of contributions to the international relations discourse. And I bring to mind, with the help of uh, former director of the Institute, Brian Lynch, a memorable address by the former Commonwealth Secretary General, Sir Sonny Ramphal, in that regard. I now invite you to address us, Your Excellency, 
and to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that whatever Her Excellency has to say will be followed by me advancing to her three questions with an opportunity for her to respond in the way that she thinks fit. At the end of that, there will be a vote of thanks moved by my board colleague, uh, Dr James Kember, and at that time, and well before your departure, there will be time for drinks and accompaniments suitable to the hour. I hope that that makes everyone feel welcome, and particularly you, Your Excellency. Goodness, I might need a box to stand on here. <laughs> Kei aku nui, ke aku rahi, rauranga tirama, tēnā koutou katoa, tuia ki runga, tuia ki raro, tuia ki roto, tuia ki waho, tuia te here tāngata, ka rongo te pō, ka rongo te ao, nō rera, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you very much, Sir Anand, for inviting me to speak uh, to this distinguished audience here about my term as Governor-General, in particular the international aspects of my role. As I look around the audience, I think I may be um, speaking to people who know rather more about that than me, actually. Um, and uh, so for that, uh, forgive me, I wasn't entirely sure what uh, the audience would be tonight, but it's very distinguished, so I thank you all for coming out. I hope I say something of interest to you. Now, as you will all know, the Governor-General's role has been traditionally described as the three Cs, that is the constitutional, ceremonial and uh, community leadership. Uh, the international role, the, the, the fourth leg, if you like, was added uh, in large part at the beginning of this century uh, in Dame Sylvia Cartwright's term as Governor-General. Of course, the constitutional function of the Governor-General's role uh, reflects the raison d'etre of the position. But in practice, the ceremonial and community roles have filled the majority of my time by far. The ceremonial is possibly the most visible. It's the, you know, the state welcomes, the investiture ceremonies for the famous and not so famous New Zealanders. Um, they typically take between five and six weeks of my time each year with up to 40 separate ceremonies at Government House in Auckland, Government House in Wellington and a few other uh, places around the country, including now we always include the South Island, and that covers our New Year and Queen's Birthday honours. We've changed our, our, many of you here will have been awardees in earlier times, um, but I just thought I should let you know it is quite different these days. Post-COVID, it was one of the few things that uh, COVID gave us a good idea about, and that was we had smaller ceremonies with people all seated, seated at tables with their uh, whānau, and so we have a lot more ceremonies than was, was the, um, in the past. And then, of course, there are commemorations of special events like Waitangi Day, Anzac Day, national tragedies, and times of national celebration. So my community leadership program has enabled me to focus on particular areas of our way of life and includes my role as patron of over 140 charities and service organisations, as well as visiting regions and meeting people the length and breadth of the country. At the beginning of my term, I selected four lenses that I proposed to use to determine and prioritise the activities I would undertake in this community role, and they were creativity, diversity, innovation and leadership. Uh, although they are necessarily broad, I'm pleased to say they've stood the test of time, and I've found them a useful guide in determining how to allocate the time and resources of my office to the myriad of events and that I'm asked to attend or host. Now, I know of more particular interest for this audience is the international aspect of my role. Dame Sylvia described it as promotion of New Zealand's identity and sovereignty as an independent nation. 
Essentially, it covers the Governor-General's role as representative of our Head of State, both here on home soil and in other jurisdictions. After almost five years in the role, I'm qualified to reflect on that aspect of the role, I guess, though I must note that circumstances have conspired to keep me in Aotearoa much more than my recent predecessors. The extent of travel by the Governor-General is always determined by the Prime Minister and the Government of the day, and that can vary. But over the past 18 months, our closed borders due to the pandemic have, as you will appreciate, had a significant impact on the opportunities that I have had to fulfil the international aspects of my role. And I don't see much opportunity for that to change in the near future, or indeed in the next three months. As it happens, the Trans-Tasman bubble, travel bubble opened up in time for David and me to go to Australia for a state visit to meet my counterpart in Canberra and also to visit the Governor of Tasmania in Hobart earlier this month. A planned visit to Melbourne as part of that trip was cancelled by the recent community COVID outbreak there and consequent pause in our connection with Victoria. Given the commonalities we share, I was really pleased to have the opportunity to honour the tradition whereby the Governors General of our two countries visited, visit each other once during their terms. It was the first Head of State visit that Canberra had hosted since the pandemic uh, began, so we really got the royal treatment. Unfortunately, the appointed day for our official welcome was very wet. So the ceremonies, including the royal salute, were all conducted in, indoors, much, I think, to the horror of our defence force. Leaving that aside, I was delighted that our teams working together had arranged a unique commencement to the traditional elements of the ceremony, which combined a welcome to country from representatives of the Ngunnawal people, including a traditional dance accompanied by a didgeridoo, with a karanga and karakia from the Komatua and Kuya who work with our High Commission in Canberra. It felt really special and a wonderful combination of the two cultures of our First Peoples. In my capacity as Governor-General of New Zealand's realm countries, I visited the Cook Islands and Nui early in my term. In fact, that was my first international visit as Governor-General. It was time to celebrate how Te Moana Nui Akiwa, the Pacific Ocean, connects Aotearoa and the Pacific Islands, and to acknowledge New Zealand's special ties, responsibilities and obligations towards our Pacific Fano. During the Tuia 250 commemorations in Gisborne two years ago, the stirring arrival of the Waka Haurua and the emotional welcome of and by the Tahitian delegation brought home just how close those historical, linguistic and cultural ties are. Sadly, my scheduled visits to the other two realm territories, Tokelau and Antarctica, were both cancelled because of the pandemic. A very enjoyable aspect of my role has been receiving credentials of foreign diplomats to New Zealand and farewelling them at the end of their assignments. <laughs> Indeed, I just today farewelled the ambassador from Hungary. The welcome ceremonies are a unique mix of Māori challenge and waiata from a Defence Force Māori cultural group with a small military guard and band outside on our south lawn at Government House in Wellington, or at least when the Wellington weather permits it. This is followed by a formal ceremony inside where the new ambassador reads a speech outlining their intentions and aspirations for their role. In the normal course, a government minister attends to advise me formally to accept their credentials. I then respond with a brief speech about the links between our two countries and the opportunities for future collaboration. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade Chief of Protocol uh, then introduces their colleagues who are on hand to witness this event, and we finally pose for official photographs. 
Now, we include the diplomats, partner and family where appropriate in these, in these occasions, which is, I understand, a uniquely New Zealand approach. Even these events were curtailed by COVID-19, and last year we resorted to receiving credentials of several of our non-resident ambassadors by Zoom. It has been a real pleasure to be able to host these ceremonies in person again this year. Zoom may be good for some things, but it is not ideal for receiving credentials. Uh, indeed, we have at least two more credential days uh, scheduled, I think, in my remaining three months in office. So we have something of a backlog, particularly of those ambassadors who are resident in Canberra. I really have enjoyed these opportunities to meet ambassadors and high commissioners and to hear their insights on a range of matters. On those occasions, I'm frequently reminded that wherever we come from, we face the same existential challenges. The solutions require concerted action, which in turn needs to be facilitated by strong and resilient diplomatic ties. When heads of state or members of the royal family visit New Zealand, the Governor-General hosts their state welcome at Government House. In my time, I've hosted the King of Jordan, the King and Queen of Tonga, the King and Queen of the Netherlands, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. I've welcomed the Presidents of Germany, Ireland, Croatia, Hungary, Indonesia, Estonia, Poland, Chile and Korea, and the Governor-General of Australia, as well as the Premier of China and the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, and the former President, Barack Obama. These have largely been splendid and most enjoyable occasions, often followed by state lunches or dinners in our government house, dining room or ballroom. One occasion that didn't go exactly to plan was the visit of the President of Hungary, His Excellency Janos Ader, on the 14th of November, 2016. That may ring a bell with some of you. Unfortunately, earlier that morning, Wellington was badly affected by the Kaikoura earthquake. While we were not affected at Government House, we soon learned that most others were not so fortunate. The Hungarian delegation had been evacuated from their hotel down 19 levels of stairs in the middle of the night. <laughs> And the Defence Force Guard of Honour, plus many of our staff, were unable to travel to Government House as many roads, including State Highways 1 and 2, were closed because of earthquake damage. So the official welcome and the state lunch had to be cancelled. Instead, we hosted the President and his wife for a small informal lunch, which was put together by a skeleton kitchen staff. Now, Hungary doesn't experience earthquakes, I learned, and I recall that our guests were rather shattered by the experience. Understandably, the opportunity for the usual wide-ranging discussion about international matters was rather limited by their anxiety about potential continuing aftershocks. <laughs> I have to say that actually it went from bad to worse because actually they left us quite quickly looking forward to getting out of Wellington and they flew to the Waikato, which was in the middle of a weather bomb. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think they may have left the country soon after. I reminded the ambassador today when he came to, um, to say his farewells and he, he just, um, it wasn't the highlight of his time here either. <laughs> Given the frequency of vice-regal interactions with international dignitaries, it is of course a logical development for the Governor-General to be undertaking high-level representation of New Zealand overseas. And looking back through our records, because I didn't have a lot of my own to rely on here, I see that former Governors-General have represented New Zealand at many significant world events or commemorations. In 1989, Sir Paul Reeves went to Tokyo for the state funeral of Emperor Hirohito. 1992, Dame Kath Tizard went to Seville Expo 92, the King of Tonga's birthday celebrations, and the state funeral of the President of Nauru. 
Funerals for foreign heads of state are frequently attended by our Governor-General of the day. Sir Anand, I recall that you had the privilege of attending the funeral of, of Nelson Mandela. I imagine that that was an unforgettable experience. Sir Jerry attended the funeral of King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia in 2015, which would also have been pretty remarkable, I should imagine. And I flew to Vanuatu for the funeral of their president in 2017 in a Hercules. <laughs> Took five and a half hours. <laughs> anyway, at least I remember it. <laughs> Another significant funeral, that of the King of Thailand, also occurred during my term. But I was in Israel for the commemoration of the Battle of Beersheba at that time, and New Zealand was instead represented by former Prime Minister Jim Bolger. Of course, commemorations and ceremonies, weddings and funerals and the like of members of our royal family have traditionally been attended by our governors general and before then um, our governors. In normal times, I would have attended the funeral for Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, earlier this year. Instead, I delivered a tribute at our public memorial service in Wellington which I believe was the only public memorial service able to be held for him in any realm country, including the UK, uh, due to the various lockdown protocols in place around the world. It seems to have been in Dane Sylvia's term that a substantial international travel programme was developed in conjunction with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Governor-General. During her five-year term, she made official visits to some 30 countries to raise our profile and develop people-to-people -people links. This pattern of representing New Zealand through visits overseas to countries with whom we have particular connections continued throughout Sir Anand and Sir Jerry's terms of office and has, I believe, been very well received. In addition to such official visits of a diplomatic nature, Governors-General have frequently represented New Zealand at commemorative events around the world on significant state occasions, uh, as, of course, those funerals I mentioned and enthronements. For my part, I was honoured to represent New Zealand at Anzac Day commemorations in Anzac Cove and Chanak Bear in Gallipoli in 2018, at the World War 100 commemorations in Messine in Belgium, Le Quenois in France, and Besheva in Israel, and at D-Day commemorations in Southampton in June 2019. Later in 2019, David and I attended the enthronement celebrations for Emperor Naruhito of Japan, and we went on to Korea for the naming of Aotearoa, the Royal Navy's newest vessel vessel, uh, and I was attending that in my capacity as the ship's sponsor. Governors-General have also traditionally travelled to support our athletes at Commonwealth and Olympic Games. David and I were able to meet and support our athletes at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in 2018, which was a very enjoyable occasion. However, sadly, COVID restrictions will prevent us from attending the Olympics this year in Tokyo. Tomorrow, I travel to Auckland to farewell our Olympic team as they set off to compete in games that will be devoid of any international spectators. In non-pandemic times, I believe that international visits by Governors General can open the door to further development of bilateral relations and contribute to New Zealand's profile in those countries. I was pleased to undertake an official state visit to Malaysia in 2017, as well as a short visit to Barbados that same year, in that latter case to acknowledge the support the Caribbean states had given to our successful bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council. During his term, my immediate predecessor, Sir Jerry, visited several countries as part of the government's programme to seek support for our bid for that seat which obviously was successful. As I look back on my term and consider the highlights of my international role, the one that really stands out for me is the trip to Italy to officially open New Zealand's pavilion at the Venice International Art Biennale in 2017. Uh, to my knowledge, it may have been the first time a Governor-General has promoted cultural diplomacy overseas, 
And I'll never forget arriving at the exhibition site on a distodona, a special form of long gondola with 16 gondoliers to propel and steer it, not unlike a ceremonial waka. With me in the distodona was our Biennale artist, Lisa Rehana, whose astonishing exhibition emissaries I was about to open. We travelled from the Grand Canal along the waterfront to the Arsenale, where Lisa's magnificent exhibition was regarded by many, including David and me, as clearly the standout show of the 2017 International Art Biennale. Lisa and I were both wearing kākahu, and the many symbolic references to waka and Aotearoa were not lost on us. It was a proud and spine-tingling moment to reflect on the meeting of cultures and highly appropriate given that her exhibition focused on the interactions between indigenous cultures of the Pacific and our European colonisers. Each of the international visits that I've undertaken has given me an opportunity to meet with our heads of mission and their teams in those jurisdictions. On these occasions, I've been able to support their work in a direct way by attending networking events and promoting New Zealand, often by giving a short speech to convey key messages from our government. In some cases, these occasions also assist to raise the profile of New Zealand and our diplomatic post with higher levels of foreign, the foreign government than might otherwise be the case. I'm thinking, for example, of my trip to Israel, where our non-resident ambassador accompanied me to meetings with both their president and prime minister, as well as the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. Similarly, following our Gallipoli commemorations, we flew to Ankara with our ambassador for meetings with President Erdogan and the Speaker of the Grand National Assembly. I also had the opportunity to continue cultural diplomacy, thanks to Sir Jerry in his role as our UK High Commissioner, to speak at a function for key cultural leaders in the UK, as well as members of the UK New Zealand Link Foundation, at the marvellous Oceania exhibition at the Royal Academy of the Arts in London in 2018. Looking to the future, COVID willing, I imagine there will be renewed opportunities for Governors General to serve Aotearoa New Zealand's interest on the international stage. I do hope so. While some might question whether the Governor General is best placed to carry out an international programme, I am firmly of the view that this is an entirely appropriate and indeed valuable role for an apolitical non-executive head of state. After all, when the Queen travelled internationally, and similarly now when the Prince of Wales or Prince William travel, they are representing the UK. Apart from when they visit realm territories, obviously, where they wear those representative crowns. I believe it's important for New Zealand to be represented internationally at head of state level, just as Canada and Australia are, by their Governors General. Although our borders are currently battened down for public health reasons, once we are able to interact freely with the rest of the world, I would encourage the government to reinstate the Governor-General's role as an international representative beyond the commemorative and ceremonial events to represent New Zealand values and culture to the wider world. Kia ora hui katoa. Your Excellency, more formal thanks will be conveyed by Dr. Kemba, but I have uh, the privilege of asking you three questions if you're willing to, uh, to entertain them. In the light of what you have said, do you think that there are benefits in pursuing collegial relationships between Governors General in countries with similar governance structures to New Zealand? Absolutely. For a start, 
those uh, countries understand the nature of the role. Uh, my recent trip to Australia is a good example of that. I was hoping actually to get to Canada at some stage, but they don't actually have a Governor-General at the moment. <laughs> um, there's a vacancy in that role. I hope that doesn't... Well, no, I don't have a view about that, but... but <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking in three months' time I'll be able to have as many views as I like. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. But, um, you know, there is always a little bit of... Um, a question mark when you go to other jurisdictions as to just what is a Governor General. Uh, so it's rather nice to be in in a country where the role is understood. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't take much to get through that, and I've always been very found very welcome in in all of those countries. You mentioned uh, the um, effect and. Uh, recollection in your memory of many pleasant occasions uh, brought about by the credential ceremonies presented by incoming ambassadors and uh, high commissioners. Has this interaction had any effect on developing your own interest in extending the international role of the Governor-General? Absolutely, and I'm delighted to see a couple of our um, diplomatic representatives here in the audience this evening. Um, I find it... Um David and I both thoroughly enjoy that opportunity. It gives us a, a short uh, insight uh, into their countries and their issues and uh, the, the challenges that the way in which they see the world and the challenges that they see in confronting us. And as I mentioned in my speech, I think I've now realised that a lot of the, um, the issues are the same around the world, particularly at the moment with our challenges with uh, climate change and biodiversity and so forth. Um, and then at the moment, inequality. I mean, Housing, which is a problem we think is a real issue in New Zealand, seems to be a problem everywhere, the affordability of it. Um, but it also gives us uh, a wonderful uh, view of the, the, um, the glories of each of these countries. And so David and I have a very long list of countries that we plan to visit just as soon as our borders are open, and enabling us to do so. Yeah. Thank you. The third question... Uh, is, and last, has the conduct of the international role provided opportunities for you as Governor-General to contribute ideas of your own? Well, that's always a tricky one, because I'm very conscious, I think, as, um, you know, an unelected official, head of state, that... Um, my role is representing the country and I'm representing the country with a government and I'm representing those views, though in an apolitical way. So I'm always, I try hard not to have too many good ideas <laughs> without <laughs> testing them out beforehand. Nonetheless, it does give me the opportunity and as you would remember yourself, Sir Anand, um, the opportunities to meet with the government through the Executive Council and other ways. Um, I feel that the opportunities to meet uh, international uh, diplomats and heads of state and then actually visit some of their countries do does give me some perspectives which I'm, I freely share at the appropriate occasion. Thanks for listening to this NZIIA audio event. To find out more about the NZIIA and the events we run, check out our website at www.nziia.org.nz. Thanks, guys.